Most of us have heard the term jurisdiction, although we are misled about what it actually means, which, of course, is a spoken oath, jure being the French for oath, diction being speech, and in Sp uh, yeah, Spanish, orar. However, most have not heard of or have any concept about the word jurisdiction, which is a written oath, jure, French for oath, description or writing. This is spoken, while well, one is spoken, jurisdiction, and the other is written, jurisdiction. Now, if you look up the French, jurisdiction, you get three hits on Google, which is interesting. Well, look at one, which is from, allegedly, 1889, Emily Coyote de Termicourt, which that's important because the book itself does not note any date or name of author. This book is Maladie Générale, or General Maladies, or as we would say, General Disease or Sickness. First section, Fever, Inflammation, or uh, Sinook. However, the part that we're looking at is actually further in the book. In one part of the book, it mentions the word jurisdiction, which says, en jurisdiction, une diète la fièvre. So that would be on a sworn oath, written oath, jurisdiction, a diet, which I assume is probably using it the same way that we do nowadays, of fever. And there's more included but there you get an understanding of how hard it is to find information on this uh, suppressed concept. It's not dead, just been obfuscated and changed. Another place we can look is called under Charter Oath in Wikipedia, or in Spanish, Carta de Juramento, which it would have something similar in French, Carte de Juramento. Anyway, the Charter Oath, Go Cajo no Go Simon, more literally the oath in five articles, was promulgated in 6 April 1868 in Kyoto Imperial Palace. The oath outlined the main aims and course of action to be followed during the Emperor Meiji's reign, setting the legal stage for Japan's modernization. Again, consider the source. The Wikipedia articles are all done with the intent to rewrite or reshape would be a good way to say it, history. Essentially changing the character of it and thus changing the event into something more palatable for their control. This also set up a process of urbanization. There's another one of their words. People of all classes were free to move jobs, so people went to the city for better work. Yeah, I doubt that. It remained influential, though less for governing than inspiring throughout the Meiji era and into the 20th century and can be considered the first constitution of modern Japan. There's all of their words there, can be considered, no direct uh, declaration, just it can be. And then, of course, we have their term modernization and urbanization, both terms they love to use a lot to diminish the role of, quote unquote, rural agrarian culture. According to Wikipedia again, and remember, consider this word. Rules, as the name implies, the text of the oath consists of five clauses. By this oath, we set up as our aim the establishment of the national wealth on a broad basis and the framing of constitution and laws. I'm sure that's mistranslated. One, deliberative assemblies shall be widely established and all matters decided by open discussion. Two, all classes high and low shall be united in vigorously carrying out the administration of affairs of state. Three, the common people, no less than civil and military officials, shall be allowed to pursue their own calling so that there may be no discontent. Four, evil customs of the past shall be broken off and everything based upon the just laws of nature. Five, knowledge shall be sought throughout the world so as to strengthen the foundation of imperial rule. Now remember, this is from Wikipedia, where everything is skewed towards one particular perspective and no others are allowed to be heard. Therefore, this is likely a mistranslation, and I'm sure that the other article is far more, possibly far more, problematic for them. The reason why that other document would be problematic for them is because they needed to change it into the Humanity Declaration 
thus removing the oath portion, making it a declaration. Uh, again, Wikipedia, the Humanity Declaration, Ningen Sengen, is an imperial rescript. What's that word there? Rescript, as in rewriting, or revision is review, etc. Issued by Hirohito, the Emperor of Japan, as part of New Year's Statement on 1st January 1946, at the request of the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers. In the rescript, which st started with his citation of the Five Charter Oath of 1868, the Emperor denied the concept of his divinity, which would eventually lead to the promulgation of a new constitution, under which the Emperor is the symbol of the state and of the unity of the people. Now, of course, as I covered in another video, the war with Japan was a instigated event specifically to pay justice to them in the eyes of the corrupt uh, alleged rulers of the universal government today uh, for their role in the execution of Jesuits at Nagasaki, Portuguese Jesuits specifically, in the year uh, 1600 something. I, I don't quite remember the date. Anyway, this looks like it's either a forgery or some event that's being misrepresented because that's all they ever do. In order to have a properly founded and legitimate written oath, a person should be something called beyond reproach, blameless, faultless, as in Jean's conduct, the school is beyond reproach. The phrase employs the verb to reproach in the sense of censure or rebuke. It used to from the early 1500s. And of course, like all the rest of this crap that we've been reading, they are attempting their best to obfuscate a very obvious concept. It does not have to do with conduct in school, and it does not have to do with censure or rebuke. It is simply somebody who cannot be blamed because they are beyond reproach. Their character is. Which comes to something they call a character assassination. Uh, according to Wikipedia again, it typically involves a deliberate exaggeration or manipulation of facts, the spreading of rumors and deliberate misinformation to present an untrue picture of the targeted person and unwarranted and excessive criticism. And again, like everything else, they are obfuscating this basic concept into a domain that's far easier for them to control. They also reduce this to something called ad hominem, which naturally most people would likely not look up and would simply write over, considering the fact that they have placed it under the category of the language Latin, which they also invented as a category anyway, the language. Ad hominem, Latin for to the person, short for argumentum ad hominem, which of course they're not going to translate, refers to several types of arguments which are fallacious. Don't define fallacious here, of course, they just use a word and they're like, oh yeah, you should know what that means, right? Typically, this term refers to a rhetorical strategy, again using jargon here, or phrases which are intended to convolute and be excessive. Excessive speech, it's a type of a grammatical error. Rhetorical strategy, where the speaker attacks the character, motive, or some other attribute of the person making an argument, rather than attacking the substance of the argument itself. So... In this context, they're stating it only relates to diction or speech, which it does not. This avoids genuine debate by creating a personal attack as a diversion often using a totally irrelevant but often highly charged attribute of a person's character or background. That's not entirely true. You can definitely attack someone's character and it be a part of an argument strategy because it is constantly done today. So the amount that they say that you can't do it and it's wrong, they do it right all the time. The most common form of this fallacy is A makes a claim of fact to which B asserts that A has a personality trait, quality, or a physical attribute that is repugnant, thereby going entirely off topic, and hence B concludes that A has the wrong fact. And I'm not going to read the rest of that. That's all garbage. They always like to reduce things, that, things down to convoluted and complex statements. And then when you do something like that, they accuse you of grammatical error. And so it goes. To establish uh, legitimacy of character, and thus make somebody beyond reproach, where the so-called character assassination will not work, is something done through some, through what they call character evidence. According to Wikipedia again, character evidence is a term used in the law of evidence to describe any testimony or document submitted for the purpose of proving that a person acted in a particular way on a particular occasion based on the character or disposition of that person. Again, more misleading garbage because it's very simple character evidence is evidence that proves the character of another person thus making them 
beyond reproach, incapable to assassinate based on character. Their argument could be faulty, but that individual is safe. Whereas if that person has a bad or repugnant character, it doesn't matter what they do, everybody is going to um, question it, right? They're going to say, oh, well, consider the source, right? That's the reason why they spend so much effort on this, because they are a bad source. They have bad character. Individuals in the university system have bad character. They're liars. They obfuscate. They do all of these things, and they're well-known. Politicians have bad character. Bankers have bad character. Lawyers have bad character. They all have bad character because their profession is known for bad character. Their profession is known for doing bad things. And so anytime anyone says something, other than the fact that we're all trained to constantly follow them, despite the fact that we constantly complain and say that they lie all the time and everything else like that, you know, there's all of these phrases for it. It is ingrained in our culture that lawyers lie, they have a tongue of a snake, and that politicians lie, and that bankers only care about money and nothing else. It is ingrained in our society that all the people that pretend to control it have bad character. This is the reason why they focus so much on this particular concept, especially when it comes to character evidence and written oaths. While I was in the Marine Corps, I had to deal with this personally when I had to go around and get character statements, which is a part of the court martial proceedings, but can also be found in during non judicial punishment proceedings, often called NJPs, which are generally used for less serious things, but sometimes an NJP can turn into a court martial, especially when you have such a thing as a request mast. And Individuals can, in fact, request a court-martial out of, well, actually, for any reason at all. You do not need, as in the civilian side, a specific prosecutor to drive a court-martial. Any member of the Uniformed Armed Forces can request trial by court-martial. That's pretty much how you would phrase it, too. One of the elements in these proceedings is something called the provide character statement, and here we have a essentially a pan, uh, template to follow. It states, one, you have been asked to write character statement on behalf of blank for use in the Marines court martial or administrative separation hearing. Those are two different things, by the way, Marines court martial or administrative separation hearing, not and. This statement is to be used in lieu, that means in place, it's French, of you testifying in person. Thus, if you're able to testify in person, you do not need to write a statement. That's pretty straightforward, right? Two, this is an extremely important undertaking, regardless of the seriousness of the alleged offenses. Your input will have a direct and meaningful impact on the findings and on sentencing. In either case, the Marine deserves to have the members and or the military judge know as much as possible before passing judgment. Please take a moment before writing and reflect on the good things this Marine has done for you and your command. Then please assist the Marine in the presenting himself to the tribunal in the most positive light by writing a brief one or two page statement. Three, the outline enclosed is designed to help you write your statement and ensure that the contents are admissible in court. If you know the Marine is pleading guilty, the rules of evidence are much more relaxed and you can expand on the outline and be as detailed as you like. Four, please write this in paragraph format and don't forget to sign and date it. That's forming it into an act, by the way, when you sign and date it. Uh, that's also a, a written oath. Right? That's considered today anyway a written oath, although it shouldn't be, because a, a written oath should actually be an oath, as in you would speak an oath, you would write it the same way, right? Except nowadays it's not practiced like that. Anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to contact blank at blank blank. Character statement for rank name, uh, fill name, or no, first name, middle, last name. One, your personal information, rank name, current unit, years of service, troop leading experience, current built description, personal awards and decorations, optional. Now, under personal awards and decorations, this is very important. There is something called a good conduct medal. When somebody gets that, that forms alone in itself evidence of character. You can submit that anywhere for any reason at any time as evidence that you have upstanding or beyond reproach character. It will stand up against character assassination, essentially, as they term it. 
but really it's uh, also called by lawyers deposition or deposing of character, which they usually use when it comes to witnesses. Two, how you know the Marine, if you supervised or worked with the Marine days per week, hours per day, number of months, location, describe your bill at a time, describe the Marine's bill, responsibilities, bill, of course, being sort of like a temporary title, a position that you're filling to do something specific. It doesn't have to do with your job field or your rank. If you socialize or observe the Marines outside of work, describe the frequency and context, observation and opinion of character traits. Observation of military performance list as many of the following traits are observed during the three months that I supervised blank and during the nine months that I have known blank. I had ample opportunity to observe his slash her initiative, MLS knowledge, training of personal loyalty, initiative knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Which we see a lot of this today in LinkedIn endorsements, but nobody takes those seriously. And LinkedIn endorsements obviously are not signed or simply put there by a profile, which might or might not be fake. When it comes to character evidence, as far as a official document that can be used in, well, it can be used in certain courts of law, but it would be inadmissible in most courts of law today. And most of the so-called courts of law today uh, will not admit anything that is not hand delivered by a one of their licensed agents and obfuscated so that you're always going to lose, basically. Well, in the military courts, which are about as legitimate as we can get today, uh, as far as the established concept of what courts are, rather than the usurpations that we have to deal with, which are also in incredibly old, too, despite the fact they pretend that it's new. Well, they will admit this stuff because this is the legitimate procedure or due process as the Constitution refers to it. Last part, opinion of military character. Based on my observation and knowledge of blank, I have formed an opinion of his slash her military character. In my opinion, he has a an poor, above average, excellent, outstanding military character. In addition, I'm familiar with Marine's reputation in our community as to military character. Marine's reputation is that his slash her military character is poor, above average, excellent, outstanding. Truthfulness, during the course of my observation and supervision of blank, there have been occasions when I had to rely on his slash her truthfulness. Based on that contact and my knowledge, I have formed an opinion of Blake's character for truthfulness. In my opinion, his slash her character for tr truthfulness is outstanding. In addition, Blake's reputation within the unit is was that his slash her character for truthfulness was outstanding. Your signature, first, middle, last. This could be considered, with your signature appended, a written oath. However, for the context of this video, the written oath takes on a very particular aspect when it comes to the fraudulent so-called law enforcement that we are subjected to today. Doesn't have to be, the character is important to the oath, the person taking the oath. If that person has bad character, then their oath means nothing. Only those with standing good standing, good behavior, only those that have good character can form an oath and be held to their word. Everyone else will just be assumed that they are going to reenact on their oath, so it means nothing. This gets into what they have styled with the obvious element of obfuscation being involved as usual. Compurgation. According to Wikipedia again, compurgation, also called trial by oath, wager of oath, and oath helping, was a defense used primarily in medieval law. See, here's their first, in the first sentence, they try to diminish it down and say, oh, it's something that was done long ago. We don't do that anymore. Well, what I just read is an example of this. A defendant could establish their innocence or non-liability by taking an oath and by getting a required number of persons, typically 12, to swear that they believe the defendant's oath. That's as we call it in the Marine Corps, character statement, essentially. The wager of law was essentially character reference, right? There it goes, character reference. Initially by kin and later by neighbors from the same region as the defendant, right, people that know them, often 11 or 12 people or 12 men, and it was a way to give credibility to the oath of a defendant at a time when the person's oath had more credibility than a written record. 
It can be compared to a legal wager, which was the provision of surety at the beginning of legal action to minimize frivolous litigation. Now, I'm not going to get into all of their frivolous language there, <laughs> but essentially speaking, the concept of congregation does not have to only do with the fact that you can get a bunch of people to sign and say you have good character. But it also has to do with the character of those people signing. Obviously, if a thief signs a statement stating you have good character, well, who's going to believe that, right? Somebody who has a history of theft, right? Not just somebody who's being labeled a thief. I don't mean that. I mean somebody who's really got bad character. Versus somebody who has never done anything bad in their life, who's upstanding in the community, who's done all of this other stuff and blah, 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 and is generally recognized among everyone as a good person, their, their statement's going to carry a lot more weight than the person who's, um, as we see it today, been out of prison. Although that whole scheme is designed for other purposes. I'll get to that later. Compregation was found in early Germanic law in early French. Très ancien coutume de Breton. That's the very old custom of Britain. In Welsh law and in the English ecclesiastical courts until the 17th century, in common law it was substantially abolished as a defense of felonies by the Constitutions of Clarendon in 1164. There you go. This Wikipedia article is going to say that congregation was abolished about as many times as it can without being too obvious about it. They want to really hammer that in. Congregation is not practiced today, and the idea of congregation or collecting oaths of character or any of these other things is not practiced today. It's been abolished. Don't talk about it. Ignore it. And it's all labeled under congregation, which is a very annoying and difficult word to search. The defense was still permitted in civil actions for debt and vestiges of it survived until statutory repeal at various times in common law countries in England in 1833 and Queensland at some point before the Queensland Common Practice Act of 1867, which makes direct reference to the abolition of wager of law. You see how they're playing their word games here. And it's very obvious, considering the people that run these things all have bad character, why they would want to do away with things like character oaths or written oaths and and upstanding character all of these things they don't want to have because they don't have upstanding character they're thieves liars and they do all this other stuff and it's commonly known even if they are not actually held to proper justice and account for supporting defendants oath a defendant who elected to make his law that's obviously written in a very derogatory and uh diminishing or contemptuous manner was permitted to make a statement before the court, swear an oath that it was true, and present one or more individuals, often twelve, who swore that they believed and had told the truth under oath. The predominant form of defense in feudal courts had persisted for a time in the common law courts. The individuals did not testify about the fact itself, and indeed might have no personal law knowledge concerning it. The value of a man's oath might vary with his status. Sometimes it was necessary for a defendant to meet a charge by assembling oaths of prescribed monetary value. Because oath-making often had religious implications for those who served as oath helpers, and because there was also possibility of legal sanctions, penalties, and there they go with their stupid word there, sanction, the individuals might refuse to give oaths for persons with bad reputations. Yeah, no crap. One reason for the long survival of the practice was that wagers in law were often considered better evidence than account books in cases of debt. And I would say that's still true today. Welsh law allowed for a form of congregation called asach, which required not 12, but 300 compurgators. That sounds to me like what we call a petition. A statute from 1413, 1 Henry 5, C5. And again, they're just showing their hand and who they are because that is written like an attorney would write it with their uh, bracketed reference to a particular article from a long time ago, as if you're going to go and just look that up based off of their reference there. Ugh. Can't just actually say what it is. They have to make it and then they say oh it's so that it's easier to read yeah yeah sure easier to read when they put like 15 of those in a document and you have to constantly go researching this and that which then references this and that and you have to go research those and blah 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 and you just waste your time all day anyway it refers to the then late rebellion in wales and complains that the welshmen are still taking revenge for the deaths of their kinsmen against the king's faithful lieges some of such lieges they keep in prison until they have paid ransom or until they have purged themselves of the death of said rebels I love that. The person who wrote that obviously is coming from the perspective is these people are wicked and evil and they shouldn't be doing that, but 
considering what's going on today, I think a lot of these little criminals running around pretending to be quote unquote law enforcement, especially the attorneys, should have this done to them. <laughs> that, that would be uh, some form of justice anyway. There, there's probably better ways to go about it, but this uh, seems a bit cheeky, and I think it's cool. They have something called a popper's oath. This is done specifically to invalidate the character of somebody who does not own things. Essentially, as they would determine, a have-not. They want to make it the fact that you not having something is testament to bad character. That's what they want to do. See, they can't get you on things like theft or any of these other things. They want to say that, oh, because you don't have anything, you're likely to do all this stuff, and therefore you have bad character just because you don't have all the money like they hoard. Thus making them, of course, the most upstanding of poss of, of, of the, the society because they've stolen everyone's money, they own all of it, and therefore they don't have to make pauper's oaths, and therefore they have upstanding character. Anyway, a pauper's oath is a sworn statement or oath by a person of being completely destitute or a pauper without much money or property. A person without the ability to pay court costs, also known as being indigent, has the option to swear a pauper's oath to file a lawsuit without paying filing fees. And here they're, you know, giving, throwing you a bone, right? They're, they're being charitable. Prisoners filing legal actions often use a pauper's oath because persons in prison are often completely without money or any means of acquiring any. That just means that if they swear an oath, they will call it a pauper's oath. Historically, especially during the Great Depression, the pauper's oath was required as a prerequisite for receiving welfare in the United States. Well, if they can label you as a pauper, and then they can provide evidence that you're a pauper, then they can use that to say that your character is bad because you're a pauper. They do this all over the place with pretty much everything. Because if you sign a document anywhere at all whatsoever stating that you have mental disability or disorder, that is enough to discount your character and void any oaths you make. They want everybody to have questionable character so that they themselves can't be held accountable because they have bad character. They have bad character in other ways, though. But as long as they obfuscate and change what exactly bad character is, then they're safe. That's their reasoning, as clearly is designed by this term, Popper's Oath. Now, here's their super misleading and simple definition of congregation. Acquittal from a charge or accusation obtained by statements of innocence given by witnesses under oath. One definition a noun. It has no other definitions and has no other indications of what else compurgation could relate to. They simply state it has to do with a charge or accusation obtained by statements of innocence given by witnesses under oath. That's it. It's a lot more than that, and they know it's a lot more than that. And this whole concept, they want, they put so much effort into obfuscating because this is their doom. Now, a petition, again, according to Wikipedia, a petition is a request to do something most commonly addressed to a government official or public entity. Petitions to a DT are a form of prayer called supplication. Of course, they want you to believe that a petition is to a higher authority. You're petitioning the higher authority. You know, you could never petition the public or the populace because they're no higher authority. We are. Our agents and minions that all run the little corporate little universal structure, they're the higher authority or some unknown deity. You know, you're always going to be a lower, lower being, lower than a grain of sand. In the colloquial sense, a petition is a document addressed to an official and signed by numerous individuals. A petition may be oral rather than written or may be transmitted via the Internet. Petitions are commonly used in the U.S. to qualify candidates for public office to appear on a ballot. While anyone can be a writing candidate, a candidate desiring that his or her name appear on printed ballots and other official election materials must gather a certain number of valid signatures from registered voters. In jurisdictions whose laws allow for ballot initiatives, the gathering of a sufficient number of voter records qualifies as a proposed initiative to be placed on the ballot. Blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, it's basically what we read before, Asach, the Welsh form of petition, has to do with their court structure and system can still be found in the military today and has to do with collecting a large number of individuals. And the other possible 
use of petition, even though they won't cite it here or basically anywhere else where they control the search algorithm, is a petition to the people or among the people or a petition as in a call to do something or form something like a local domestic government of citizens that is outside of the control of the corporate foreign investors that seek to preside over us against our interests and against the safety of the national defense and the security of the people. Now, the Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution specifically references compurgation without use of that ridiculous term. It states, In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses, plural, against him. Those will be people that have sworn oaths and testimony against this person, accusing them of something, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor. There's your other side of the quote-unquote compurgation, as they call it, which is not abolished whatsoever as far as the Constitution goes anyway. They abolished it because they don't follow the Constitution and they're illegitimate. And to have the assistant of counsel for his defense. There you go. That is a clean, cut, and dry example of compurgation in the U.S. Constitution. And the reason why they would not have used the word compurgation is because that's a newly invented word despite the fact that they say it comes from Latin. Now, in the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, the fraudulent warrants that are sent out today under the pretext of the U.S. Constitution, they will state they have jurisdiction. That means they have spoken oath. They have claimed it by speaking an oath. However, they do not provide juriscripture, meaning the writing, to back that up. This is referencing juriscripture or the writing, where it states it has to be supported by oath or affirmation. That's a separate document. And it has to particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. They deliver you usually like one, a one, le one page letter, right? It's a form that's filled out and then signed. And they say that's sufficient under the Fourth Amendment. It's not because the Fourth Amendment describes essentially a whole package that you're supposed to give someone so that they can read through it and say, OK, we've got. The jurisscripture, meaning the written oath of that person. We have the document describing exactly what they're doing, where, when, what, why, how, etc. Right? And then you have the compurgation or the the character evidence to show that the person who's doing this is legitimately able to do what they're doing. They do absolutely none of that, and people don't know it because of all of this obfuscation. So anytime someone shows up at your door with a for a search warrant, right, in an extreme case, or anytime somebody does something otherwise illegitimately under the guise of the Constitution or the disguise pretending to be operating in the Constitution, you should read it and say, does it have juriscripture? Does it have a written oath? Does it have compurgation, meaning that the person has their character, has evidence that their character is beyond reproach, that they are in fact capable of carrying out what they're doing? And does it have the legitimacy afforded by law or described by law in the U.S. Constitution that they're supposed to follow if they're pretending to operate under it. Now, most of them today do not pretend to operate under the Constitution anymore. They're very open about it because they always reference their codes, which are property of the International Code Council, intellectual property. And so when they do this, they're stating essentially that they're working in their regulations, they're working in their laws, and they're following the form of their laws not the U.S. Constitution, the Supreme Law of the Land, which is sworn uh, to by the members of the U.S. Armed Forces. So let's go look at a document particularly describing exactly what I'm accusing these people of. This is from UConn Library, University of Connecticut. 2016, Juror Purgators, The Evolution of Compurgation and Jury Nullification Notes. Now, I should note 
right before I start reading this that the author of this does not like juries. He wants to do away with them. And he also does not like compurgation. He doesn't like any of these concepts, just like all of these other corrupt people. A, a university professor would despise, above all else, compurgation and juries, because that is the avenue to hold, for holding them accountable for all of the crimes and wickedness and the ridiculous, vengeful vendettas that they have brought out against the major human populace at large, the entire nation, essentially, in their disgusting and contemptuous, twisted structures that we call universities. All right. <clears throat> Note, juror purgators, the evolution of purgation and jury nullification. The ancient and medieval custom, you're going to realize that this is pretty much exactly what I read in with slight changes in Wikipedia, which they used to say was a source that you couldn't use because it was... Um, illegitimate or untrustworthy. The ancient medieval custom of compurgation, the clearing of one's name by producing oath helpers, has a long and colored past in Anglo-American law. Yeah, it's not practiced today anymore. No, it's been abolished, right? It's something of the ancient ways when people were dumb and moronic and did stupid things and burned people at the stake and crap like that. Anyway, also known as the wager of law after the late 11th century and the Norman Conquest, this process made considerable concession to the knowledge and power of local communities. Oath helpers were generally peers and were considered to know intimate details concerning the case for which they were called. Generally peers. That's one of their talking points. A jury of your peers. I love to say that a lot. This note will show that once compurgation had substantially vanished, right? Abolished. Doesn't. Don't do it anymore. It's gone because we say so. Whether before or after the assize of Clarendon, the importance of locality did not simply cease, but rather carried on, taken up through the formal inquest procedure in England. From there, it made its way into the jury trial which we may trade insofar as English law is concerned to the assize of Clarendon, though it has its beginnings long before that in general European jurisprudence. There's another one of their words that they're not going to define, and they're going to pretend like everybody's supposed to know, jurisprudence, which does not actually mean what they construe it to mean. Just like jurisdiction does not mean a place, it means a spoken oath. Final instant instantiation. That's a weird word. I wonder if that's a typo. I don't know. There's a lot of stupid words that people don't generally use. The final instantiation of this transformative process from congregation is the power of a jury to nullify. Though juries may no longer be composed of locals expected to know the law. Which law? Right? The law. That means their law. They don't mean the Constitution. They are still expected to abide some element of local custom. Though this is a highly contested issue amongst jurists, I argue that the power of nullification open to abuse, though it is. I like that little addition there. Open to abuse, though it is. Oh, yeah, like the court, fake court systems that we have today aren't abused continuously. Anyway, it's conceptually integral in the way that the modern jury system functions since other elements of vicinage or locality have been stripped out one by one as the state has grown more powerful on the ground historical timeline so there you go this guy does not like juries he does not like compurgation and he wants to get rid of both concepts entirely he wants everything to be just judges all minions and agents of this corrupt disgusting bad character system that everybody hates today but not enough people yet anyway want to Bring down. In, in the note of contents, we're not going to read this whole, whole document, it's very long and tedious. Uh, introduction, 1643, Compurgation. Oh, and of course, number four, Modernity. That's one of their lovely words they like to use a lot, and they also pretend that that's been around for forever as well, at least since the 17th century, according to them. Yeah, right. Juror Purgators, the evolution of Compurgation during nullification, one introduction. Our society has grown used to the modern shape of trial, but that ritual and procedure has not been unchanging through the centuries. 
Ancient modes of trial differed in many substantial and often surprising ways from our own. The form taken by trial reflects the social organization of the society which created it. Our own modern modes of trial are inherently tied to the way in which our society is structured. Compurgation or oath swearing, with which the article is concerned, is a fundamentally alien mode of proof and trial to us. I don't know if the writer is aware, but they probably are considering their ridiculous wording that they're doing to cover up what they're really trying to say. Alien means a lean, as in alienable rights or inalienable rights or unalienable. A lien, of course, being a instrument of debt, which is placed upon somebody to limit them until that lien is paid off. So they're using it in a particular way here, whereas it appears they're using it in a different way here. As in, they think that, and they know, that a reader would read this and substitute alien with foreign, right? A foreign mode of proof and trial to it. But in fact, he's saying it is a fundamentally debted mode of proof and trial to us. You know, like the difference there? That's called doublespeak. However, its history is of great interest to many more modern modes. Although I should say that before, that it's not technically doublespeak because it's written. So it would be double writing, I suppose. Although we don't really have a term for that. Or we probably do, but they've hidden it. There has been much scholarly debate over where and when the practice of compurgation originated. What is certain is that it played a prominent role in the dispute resolution of primary familial society. There we go with more of their contempt and their diminution of quote-unquote familial society because they hate families. And their term dispute resolution. Right? They don't like the term justice. They don't like the term trial. They don't like anything. They call it dispute resolution. So that no one's ever held accountable and everything has to do, of course, with who's got the money because they're all thieves and they have all the money, right? They have all the land and we all play in their sandbox. Anyway, the same problems of historical descent are intended on the traditional jury right. Now, some have described the jury as an outgrowth of the old Saxon custom of trial by the aldermen. There has been considerable contest on that point. The most commonly accepted re reasoning, according to this writer, of course, is that the jury trial actually only traces its roots back to the 12th century seize of Clarendon under Henry II. Compurgation bears some hallmarks that make it appear to be a first blush. Ugh. Some alike our conception of a jury trial. Indeed, there was a time during the 1870s and 80s when it was a common belief that the Anglo-American jury practice itself derived from the practice of oath swearing. Of course, this whole thing is completely full of generalizations, otherwise known as assumptions, made by somebody from a university, as they all love to do this because their job is to make people dumb and incapable of coherent thought rather than to actually teach anything useful. So they don't need to be accurate or correct on what they're talking about. The link between them may be dissolved by scholarship, right? Scholarship has dissolved the link. How did they do that? Well, they do it by reclassifying it, moving it around, changing the, the definitions, or leaving only one definition also administering the search results so you can't find what you're looking for. Right? Those are the ways that they dissolve it. There is a reason scholars thought our practice and oath swearing were akin both the medieval jury and the swearing of compurgators express a highly local concern with justice. That is, the justice need be done according to both local rule and local knowledge. Ha <laughs> ha Sounds like this guy hates the Constitution, too. There is more to this link than meets the eye. In the note following, I will make no attempt to reinstate the Victorian argument that the jury emerged from the ancient practice of compurgation. Rather, I will demonstrate that the practice of compurgation stems from the same basic need for local justice as the jury does. This concern with community judgment and local knowledge is reflected in the modern practice of criminal jury nullification, wherein a jury declares that notwithstanding the defendant's guilt, they will not convict. The groundswell of local support in the fact of the will of the state that undergirds jury nullification is inherently akin to the practice of compurgation, in which a number of oath helpers swear that the defendant did not commit the crime or der delict, regardless of the factual circumstances underlying the charge. So here he is, obviously, obfuscating jury nullification as well, that despite the guilt, they won't convict. 
Not the fact that the jury might be right and that person's not guilty. No. If a judge has decreed that they're guilty, then they're guilty. And nowadays, judges set aside jury verdicts, which you can't do under the Constitution, but you can do under illegitimate courts run by traitors and criminals, which is what we have today. Except for in the military, where you can still use character statements. Now, the practice of compurgation, under two, compurgation, has its origin somewhere in the mists of time. Ha 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 ha. In form, compurgation consisted of a defendant, civil or criminal, proving his innocence not by evidentiary obligation, but rather by swearing that he did not commit the crime or delict. Yeah, that's not true, because if you get somebody to sign an oath, then that is evidence. That is evidence of character. Anyway, this oath required helpers, purgators, to swear together to compurgare, literally to purge together where com is intensive Latin prefix, to the faithfulness and trustworthiness of the defendant. Victorians roundly criticized this form of proof as being barbaric. Oh, they love that word too. Incomprehensible and illogical. Surprised they didn't add the word illegal in there because they like to use that a lot out of its original definition. It is only in relative recent years that sense has been made of what is, to us, a completely alien form of justice. There you go. There's again that people of the past were morons and idiots, and only now today are we intelligent enough to understand what is right. <laughs> Compregation reflects a society that produced it, one that was focused on kinship and blood ties. More diminishing terms and explanations. In the early medieval world out of which compregation grew, it was not uncommon for unresolved deferences to erupt into blood feuds. <laughs> yeah, right. Type of conflict was costly and dangerous. It permitted essentially personal problems between individuals to explode in widespread community violence. Oh, what? You mean like the... Um, widespread community violence of 2020? How about that one? Right? Was that had done because of blood feuds? <laughs> Solidarity was an essential fact of tribal life. Yeah, diminishing term there. Tribal. The process of compurgation allowed one side on a potential feud to measure another. In its most basic form, families and kin groupings. Here we got a new term that he's using to diminish what these people are, and because he hates families, could come together to examine each other, the plaintiff bringing his secta, and the defendant bringing his purgators. Yeah, I highly doubt they called them that. This served as a safety valve, preventing dangerous conflicts from boiling over into the community. Ugh, this guy's writing is so tedious. Seen in this light, compurgation no longer appears so childish. However, compurgation did not remain viable in the years following the seas of Clarendon, save in ecclesiastical courts. <laughs> Nearly contemporaneous with this appearance, disappearance was the rise of the criminal and civil jury in England. The section of the note will explore first in detail the sources of compurgation in distant antiquity. Uh, yeah, abolished. It doesn't get done anymore. It, don't think about it. Then I will turn to the effects of compurgation on the society of kinship and feud. Lastly, I will conclude with the vanishing of compurgation altogether, making room for other methods of trial. <laughs> yeah, this person definitely feels safe that they're not going to be held to trial for this piece of crap that they're writing here. Basically, this is an insurrectionist piece of paper, mind you. That's why they have to disguise their language here, because what they're stating is removal entirely of any pretense of the U.S. Constitution. That is treason and insurrection. They wish to remove the supreme law. Anyway, sources of compurgation in Germanic law. The very earliest writ versions of compurgation appear to be contained in the Lex Salica, promulgated by Clovis, king of the Franks, in the late 5th or early 6th century of the Common Era. By the mid-17th century, the Edict of Rothari alluded to sacramentales, usually 12 in number, and by the end of that century, so did the law of Ine of Wessex. Whether or not compurgation was truly in wide use before the codification of the laws of the Celine, Salian Franks in the Lex Silica, Salica. Yeah, codification. I like that word because that's what they rely on nowadays, not the U.S. Constitution, even though they always speak for it. As many earlier scholars suggest, it is certain that by the mid-6th century, it was in widespread use in continental Europe, and at least by the close of the 17th century, it was used in Wessex. Now, I wouldn't bother looking up 
purgator because you'll get purgatory. Now, I did search purgatory for this specifically, but before that I did search purgator and I got purgatory. This is an obvious use of their ability to control the outlet or the font or fountain of knowledge that we could call it. The ability to research things, the access point. They are gatekeepers. They gatekeep the access point and thus they allow you to not find what you're looking for on purpose. They do this on purpose. This is not an accident or an action of somebody who is ignorant, as they would claim, and have all their minions claim to. Anyway, it states, Roman Catholic doctrine, a place or state of suffering inhabited by the souls of sinners who are expiating their sins before going to heaven. All her sins were forgiven, and she would not need to go to purgatory. That sounds like the other garbage thing that we looked to before, that somebody has good character, specifically a girl, because of her conduct in school. Now, below it, probably undesiring to and out of necessity and because they didn't want to but they had to they have a note archaic having the quality of cleansing or purifying infernal punishments of purgatory and medicinal it's obsolete archaic abolished not used anymore don't pay attention to it listen to us we know everything and you're a moron basically so they did actually get rid of the idea of the sworn statement in writing, right? The written oath. This is from the Texas Constitution, the, of course, newly revised one, one that has their fraudulent codes in it from a foreign entity. Civil Practice and Remedies Code, Title VI Miscellaneous Provisions, Chapter 132, Unsworn Declarations. Section 132.001, Unsworn Declaration, except as provided by Subsection B, an unsworn declaration may be used in lieu of a written sworn declaration. Now, why would they do that? Why would they say that you can use an unsworn declaration in the place of a sworn declaration? Maybe to get away with fraud, right? And also to do away with the quote-unquote, barbaric and obsolete forms of justice, like the U.S. Constitution, of course, to which all members of the U.S. Armed Forces swear allegiance, by the way. Verification, certification, oath, or affidavit required by statute or required by a rule, order, or requirement adopted as provided by law. That's their law, not the Constitution. This section does not apply to a lien required to be filled with a county clerk, filed with a county clerk, an instrument concerning real or personal property required to be filed with a county clerk, or an oath of office or an oath required to be taken before a specified official other than a notary public. There's your jurisdiction or spoken uh, oath, but they never have juris scripture, right? And they want to get rid of that completely entirely. And they don't want you to know that that's a concept that has ever existed at all. An unsworn declaration may under the section must be in writing and subscribed by the person making the declaration is true under penalty of perjury. So, if you have a person who makes a declaration under penalty of perjury and does it in writing, isn't that a sworn oath? Under this code, it's being listed as an unsworn declaration. So does that mean that swearing under penalty of perjury is not a legitimate oath? Food for thought. Except as provided by subsections E and F, an unsworn declaration may, made under this section must include a jurat in substantially the following form. An unsworn declaration made under this section must be in, yeah, it's, um, have a jurat. My name is blank blank. My first, middle, and last birth of date of birth, my address is blah, blah, blah. Um, I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct. Execute in blank, 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 blah, blah, blah. An unsworn declaration made under this section by an inmate must include a jurat and substantially the following form. My name is blank. Uh, blah, blah, uh, identify number, if any. Presently incarcerated. Declare under penalty of perjury. Blah, blah, blah. An unsworn declaration made under the section by an employee of a state agency or political subdivision in the performance of the employee's job duties must include a jurat and substantially the following form. And I don't know if that's jurat. I'm going off the French j versus perhaps the Spanish with J. But I'm sure 
people from Texas would pronounce that different. And okay, so my name is blank 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 and I'm an employee of the Folly Governmental Agency blank and I'm executing this declaration part of my assigned duties and responsibilities and declared independently perjury the foregoing is true and correct, blah blah blah. And then of course the, all of those run in line with all of their other garbage where nobody can make a sworn statement simply off of the character standing of that individual. They all have to be corralled into their little boxes and little places and they can't step outside of that. You are not allowed to do things in any sort of quote unquote private capacity because they won't allow you as far as in the areas they control, which is virtually everything. They control Google. They control the uh, alleged appearance of justice as it is today. It appears that the only place, for not for lack of trying, that they don't entirely control today is the United States military. That's virtually the only place that they don't entirely and 100% control. And they have tried for a long time to completely solidify control over the U.S. military. But traditions in the Marine Corps, as I'm aware, are incredibly difficult to obfuscate. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channel, and join my newly formed Discord. Check out my other content. Also, there are free books available at the links. And if you so desire, you may support my work and any of the options available. Thank you.